Last time we talked about the simplest curves and, and surfaces in space, also known as lines and uh, planes. And today we'll talk about more, more complicated objects of the same kind, also curves and surfaces. Okay? So let me just briefly uh, remind you what we did last time. I know it's a warm September afternoon, and you want to be elsewhere, some of you, maybe, but you, you will, you will get there. Just, you know, the sooner we start, the sooner we finish, okay? So, I want to use, from now on, I will be using this notation, R3, for the three-dimensional space. So, R is for real numbers. And then uh, we write R to the end for, for the n-dimensional space. So, R2 would be the plane, and R3 will be the three-dimensional space, okay? So, sometimes it will be convenient to just abbreviate instead of saying space. Now, lines and planes in R3 can be, can be uh, defined or represented in a very concrete way, which we discussed last time. For lines, it's a parametric form, which means that each of the three coordinates in R3 is written as a function of an auxiliary coordinate, which you call t, but it could be any other coordinate, any, any other letter you like. So let's use t. So then it, the, the formulas will be, look as follows. x is x0 plus at, and y is y0 plus bt, z is z0 plus ct. Where these numbers are given, this are x0, y0, and z0, and abc are given, and they correspond to the following. x0, y0, and z0 are coordinates of a particular point on this, on this line, and abc is a particular vector which goes along this line. We call it the direction vector. So that's ABC. So each of the coordinates is written as a function of T, and this tells us, um, a gives us an explicit parameterization of this line. In other words, for each value of T, each value of T gives rise to a particular point on this line. For instance, T equals 0 corresponds to this point, T equals 1 corresponds to this point, and so on. Now, for planes, we did something different. For planes, we did something different. A plane doesn't have a direction vector, right? A plane is not de determined by one direction. It's determined by two directions, or two vectors, like, like so. That's why it's a two-dimensional object. If it could be determined by one vector, it would be one-dimensional, like a line. So, in fact, if we wanted to imitate the same procedure for planes, we would have to choose two independent coordinates. We cannot parameterize the entire plane, which is a two-dimensional object, by one coordinate. We have to parameterize by two coordinates. Now, it's possible to do that. In fact, eventually, later in this course, we will, talk, we will be talking about parameterization surfaces. But for now, we try to choose a more economical way. And a more economical way for a plane is, instead of writing a parametric form, to write down one equation. And for that equation, instead of trying to determine the plane by things which belong to it, we determine the plane by something which is orthogonal or perpendicular to it, by a normal vector, which is our favorite, my favorite image of this class so far. OK? So very easy to remember. So that's a normal vector. So see, the point is that there are two vectors. There should be two independent vectors determining the plane. But it's also determined by one vector, which is perpendicular to it. So the parameterization, instead of a parameterization, we have one equation. And the equation has a form a times x minus x0 plus b times y minus y0 plus c times z minus z0 is equal to 0. And I'll draw it here. So that's a plane. And that's a normal vector. I draw it in a different color. It's not a direction vector, it's perpendicular. It's perpendicular to the plane. That's why we call it n. We call it n, uh, a normal vector. And um, that's the vector abc. So these are the data abc, which are given the, the coordinates of the normal vector, components of the normal vector. And again, there is a particular point chosen, x0, y0, and z0, as before. You get, you get this equation by looking at it, by using dot product. So to derive this equation, you use dot product. But at the end of the day, what you get is this, is this kind of equation. And this lets you write, uh, describe mathematically algebraically describe a given plane once you know the point and, um, and the normal vector. And there are various ways in practice to find those data from the information which is available. For instance, a typical problem on homework is like this. Suppose you're given three points, and that there is a unique plane. If the points are in generic position, there is a unique plane which passes through all of them. And the question is to write down an equation of this sort. How to do that? Well, you need one point and one, and one normal vector. So you have three points. Choose one of them. And then you need to find the normal vector. And you, know, you find the normal vector by taking a cross product of two vectors which belong to the plane, which you can easily find by subtracting coordinates of these of this points. So you, you get this n is a cross product of this guy and this guy. So that's the way you do it. You just obtain the information needed for this formula by using the information which is given. Are there any questions about this? OK, good. So what's next? So next, we'd like to understand um, more complicated objects in, in the dimensional space, in R3. And uh, we start with, uh, with, uh, with two-dimensional objects. So you want to look at more complicated, more complicated surfaces in R3. Now the question is, what's the next example to consider? Okay. So here, we have a plane, we understand planes fairly well. It's a, it's a, very, a very simple equation. And so what's, what is an important feature of this equation? Well, if you look at this formula, it's actually a good idea to open the brackets. Sometimes it's a good idea to open the brackets and, and really think of this as a function of x, y, and z on the left-hand side. So if you open the brackets, let me do it in another board. If you open brackets, you get ax plus by plus cz plus, you even get a combination of ax0 and so on, which I, will, I would like to con convert into, in, in, into one symbol, which I'll call d. So d is just negative ax0, negative y, negative b, y0, negative c, z0. Okay. But it's kind of long, so, but, but the point is that all these numbers are given. It's all of them are given. So it is a number, unlike x, y, and z. Maybe, maybe uh, it's good to emphasize that by using different chalk points. 
So you might see the very important point is these are variables. These are variables. And these are numbers. They're given. And any given problem, this will be some particular numbers. So one, two, three, five, whatever. Mm -hmm. So we look at this. We look at this formula. And we see that on the left hand side, on the left hand side is a function of three variables x, y, z of the simplest possible kind. Simplest possible kind means that each variable enters in degree at most one. At most one. So it's a polynomial of degree less of degree one. It's a polynomial of degree one. So what I'm trying to say is that suppose we were just, just for the sake of it, we were to try to write down various functions in x, y, and z. So what are the simplest things that we could possibly write? Well, first thing is a constant function. It's kind of, this is sort of a trivial example in some sense. It's a constant function, or maybe just any number, not necessarily one you could write well, square root of two or pi or three or ten, whatever. But the point is it's a number. It is not, it's independent of the variables. So that's a simplest function. At the next level, we've got x, y, and z. These are monomials in x, y, z of degree one. Right? At the next level, we can form x squared, y squared, and z squared. And we can also have a mixed combinations like x, y, uh, x, z, and y, z. So these are monomials of degree two. These are monomials of degree two. And these are of degree one. And if you want, this is of degree zero. <laughs> and of course, you can continue. So next, you would write x cube, y cube, z cube, and then you'll have mixed terms of, different, of different kind. It's actually it's, it's a very interesting question to see how, how the number of this independent monomial grows uh, as the degree grows. It, it actually grows very fast. It's going to grow very fast. So it's actually good, a good exercise to find the formula for the number of independent monomials. So you see here, you have one, and you have three, and you have six. What's the next number? So anyway, you don't have to do it now, but think about it. It's a good, it's a good question. So uh, if, we, if, we are, if we want to be methodical, one way to approach the question about general general functions in three variables or uh, general surfaces in R3, which are essentially very close to questions which are close to each other, then we should start with the simplest ones, with, with surfaces defined by the simplest functions, and then progress and include more and more complicated ones. Of course, we're not going to go all the way, you know, like two, three, four, up to ten, but at least if you want to do the next possible example, we might as well just go to the next step and the next level in this picture. So what we've done so far, and that's my point, is this, the first two levels. Because the most general expression which involves these four guys, the constant function the, uh, mono and, the, and the monomials of degree one, is precisely what's written on the left-hand side of this equation. So using that expression as an equation, you get the simplest possible equation that you can write on three variables. And sure enough, it gives you the simplest possible surface name in plane. So now if you would like to continue and go to the next level, we should include polynomials, monomials of degree two. Okay. And this way, we get what's called the quadratic surfaces, which is one of the subjects of today's lecture. Quadratic surfaces. So the idea is to include all monomials of degrees 0, 1, to 2. And that should be viewed as a natural generalization of the planes, which include all monomials of degrees 0 and 1. Okay. So the question is, what kind of surfaces do we get this way? What do they look like? So this should give us a good um, set of examples, which uh, might be convenient in the future when we talk about general surfaces. We can test things. Not, we'll be able to test things not only by using planes, but also using those quadratic surfaces. That is the general idea. Now, another general idea is, when you get a problem in R3, try to do it in R2. Or maybe even R1. In other words, if you have a problem in a three-dimensional space, try to look at the kind of a baby version of that problem in a smaller dimensional space, which would be, in this case, a plane. The problem, this problem is already meaningful, or a similar problem is already meaningful in R2. So look at, let's look at, look first at the analogous problem in R2. In R2, we only have two variables, x and y. Okay? And so it's easier to analyze what are the corresponding curves. I remind you that in R2, because it's two-dimensional, if we impose one equation, we're going to end up with a one-dimensional object. Because two minus one is one. Right? So in R2, we can also impose one equation of the form linear combination of all monomials of degree 0, 1, and 2. So that would be x squared. Let me keep using the red, uh, the red color. x squared, y squared, and then you've got xy, and then you also have a constant. So you'll have some a, x squared, plus b, y squared, plus c, xy. Uh, sorry, and of course, you also have the, the ones of degree 1. So you have plus x. Um, so it'll be some D plus some E, Y plus some A, B, C, D, E, F. So it's a little bit easier because there are fewer, fewer monomials in two variables. You see only have two of degree one and you have three of degree, of degree two as opposed to three and six respectively in dimension three. So what, what does this represent? What does this equation represent? Well, the point is that it looks like there are too many possibilities because there are seven free parameters, A, B, C, D, E, uh, uh, six, par seven param uh, six parameters, right? Six parameters, okay. So too many, right? But of course, the, let's, let's, let's think about it this way. We can always... If, for example, we, we can combine some expressions into a square, then we can always say that by changing variables slightly, we will get we will eliminate some, some, some parameters. So what I mean to say is the following. Say, this is something that we looked at before when we talked about circles. Suppose you have an equation like this, x minus 1 squared plus y plus 2 squared equals 1, right? So if you open the brackets, you end up with like x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus y squared plus 4y plus 4 plus 1. So you know then you bring, you bring the terms, and so it's like x squared minus 2x plus 
Uh, let's write first this f completely. Uh, plus y squared minus 2x plus 4y. And then you have 1 plus 4 minus 1, so plus 4. So see, this is an expression like this. The only thing, it's, it's almost like a most general expression, except there's no term with x, y. But you've got x squared, y squared, x, and y. You see, it looks, very, it looks quite complicated. But the point is that if you complete uh, the, this, if you complete this to square and this to square, you actually end up with something much more manageable because we can say, let's introduce new coordinates, x prime, which is x minus 1, and y prime, which is y plus 2. Okay? Then, if you do that in substitute, then we actually, then we actually will end up with x prime squared plus y prime squared equals 1. And that's a circle, right? It's a circle radius 1 but with respect to this new coordinates. So what does it mean for the original problem? Well, the original problem it simply means that we have shifted the origin in the, in the xy plane. This is the original xy plane. And uh, we introduce new coordinates x prime and y prime. So for example, when x is 1, that corresponds to x prime equals 0. So what we've done is we've introduced new, a new coordinate system by just simply shifting the, the old axis. We've shifted the y axis by 1, because now this, this is x equals 1. But x equals 1 corresponds to x prime equals 0. And likewise, we have the second line here, which corresponds to y equals negative 2, which is nothing but y prime equals zero. So we've got a new coordinate system with new coordinates x prime and y prime, right? And the point is that the circle, this is the equation of the circle in this new coordinate system, where the circle has as the center the origin of this new coordinate system. So it looks like this. That's the circle we're talking about. But if we can understand it in the new coordinate system, then surely, then surely we understand it in the old coordinate system. Because what it means simply uh, is that it is still a circle, but it's a circle centered instead of the origin of the old coordinate system, centered at the point, at the point, let me write it in white, emphasizing that this is the coordinates in the old coordinate system, uh, uh, one and two, one and negative two, the center. Do you see what I mean? Are there any questions about this? By, by choosing slightly better coordinates, you get a much better expression for, for your equation. Okay? So then the question is really not so much to understand what each of these equations gives rise to, but what is the simplest form to which we can bring this equation by making a similar coordinate change. So what kind of coordinate changes are allowed? First of all, shifts are allowed, like this. x goes to x minus 1, y goes to y plus 2. That certainly should be allowed because, I mean, we don't lose anything. Clearly, we can work with this coordinate system in as much as we can work with this coordinate system. The other thing which we should allow is rotations, rotations of the plane, which would mean the following. You have, this is your original coordinate system, and say you rotate it by 30 degrees, pi over 6, and uh, you end up with this coordinate system. So again, this is not such a big deal because, you know, think about it. If you look at like this, you see this coordinate system, but if you look like this, you get this one. So it's the same thing. It just depends on your point of view. They are equal. It's just, uh, it's, uh, we shouldn't approach things with prejudice and say that uh, it has to be like this because none of, there's no reason to say that this coordinate system is better than this one. Uh, well, th there's an important point that when we rotate, when we rotate, we preserve the angles and distances. So the essential uh, characteristics of geometry are preserved. And in, in this sense, we should not really worry too much if we can get a better shape of the equation by making a rotation. So all this was to say that even though the original equation, if you write it in the most general form, looks very complicated, you can choose, you can always choose a nice coordinate system to bring it to a much simpler form. And so what are the simpler forms that we can get? We call it, we call it sometimes a canonical form. So the canonical form for um, some other variables. In other words, there always exist some variables in which you will get the canonical form. Now, those variables would, would be more appropriate to call x prime and y prime, but I don't want to make a formula look too heavy. So I will use again x and y, even though with respect to the original equations, this will not be x and y, but it will be some x prime and y prime. Okay? So what are, the, what, are the, what are the possibilities? The first possibility looks like this. x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. This is something we have encountered before when we talk about curves on the plane. This is, an, this is what's called an ellipse. Because see, the point is, we surely know very well what the picture looks like if a and b are both equal to 1. It's again the circle of radius 1, which we keep talking about, right? which we understand very well. What we've done now is we've divided the coordinates x and y by a and b, which simply corresponds uh, geometrically to kind of squishing or expanding, depending on whether a is less or equal or greater than 1, expanding the picture along that axis. So the result of this is not a circle, but something which you get sort of a, a squished circle. Let's, let, me draw, or, let me draw a picture for it. This, this is what it will look like if a is greater than b. If a is less than b, it will be squished in this way. And in this picture, this is a, and this is negative a, and this is b, and this is negative b. Why? Because if you substitute x equal 1, you get from this term, you get 1. And then you substitute y equals 0, and you get the equation. So surely this point belongs to it, and for the same reason this point belongs to it. And similarly, if x is 0, and y is plus or minus b, these two points, we also get an equality. So that's an ellipse. Now the second, the second way, the second possibility is... The second possibility is uh, like this, x squared over a minus y, a squared minus y squared over b is equal to 1. 